Hello there. My name is Jason, and I will be taking you through eight key points in achieving the best radiographic images possible. The objectives we will be covering today will describe how to take the best image possible. We will be covering grid use, film size selection, artifacts, patient positioning, collimation, marker placement, shielding, and setting technique. Let's get to it. Our first topic of discussion is grids. Grids help us produce the best image possible by reducing scatter radiation. Scatter produces unwanted density that is unrelated to the anatomy and compromises the quality of the image. It's important to understand how and when using a grid will be beneficial to the image quality. Let's take a closer look. They be like, go, stop, can you teach me how to bucket? Cause every grid I'm using with my films look funky. This girl from fourth floor said she knew what a bucket's for. I said it's time to learn, so pick your jaw up off the floor. Teach me how to bucket, teach me, teach me how to bucket. What? Teach me how to bucket, teach me, teach me how to bucket. All the techs love me, all the, all the techs love me. All the techs money, you ain't messing with my buggy. Gets me every time. In these examples, we are witnessing improper grid utilization and the resulting poor images. A tilted grid causes grid lines and loss of density across the entire film. An upside down grid causes a loss of density on the sides with density across the middle of the film. In this example, the use of a grid is essential for producing the prettiest image possible. This future radiographer understands the general rule that a grid must be used when patient thickness is greater than 10 to 12 centimeters and KVP exceeds 90. Our next topic of discussion is how film size affects image quality. It is important to fit the part to the film so that the anatomy of interest is centered to the film and is not clipped. However, choosing a film that is too large can result in the loss of image density. Since the density of the film is greatest in the center, it is more difficult to properly position the part if you have a film too large, therefore compromising the density. Here, the future radiographer improperly chooses a 14 by 17 film for a digit. Not only is this film size impractical, but he also risks having decreased density, which reduces image quality. Here, the future radiographer chooses the most practical film size for this exam, maximizing potential density and creating the best possible image. Our next topic of discussion is artifacts. It is our job as radiographers to remove all artifacts before taking the exposure. Artifacts can resemble pathology or obstruct anatomy. This makes it more difficult for the radiologist to read the film and make a proper diagnosis. You're wondering what I have. I've got a secret that I've been hiding under my robe. I've got a necklace, it's made of metal, it'll show up on film. Film, it'll show up on film. There are many different examples of removable artifacts. 
These include jewelry, dentures, hearing aids, hair accessories, clothes, and even immobilization devices such as sandbags and sponges. Patient movement can also cause motion, which is also considered an artifact. This can be eliminated through clear patient communication. In this example, the future radiographer effectively communicates with his or her patient and asks them to remove any artifacts prior to taking the exposure. Our next topic of discussion is the importance of proper patient positioning. Improper positioning will hinder the ability to produce the best possible image. Some of the factors that you will see affecting proper positioning involve OID, known as object to image distance, and angling the part of interest which will cause a foreshortened or elongated image. One, two, three, four, five. Patients who decided to take a dive on the icy steps around the corner. The tech said, I need you on your side, but I really don't want to. We need some pictures and we'll make them good. Tell you what I'm doing and I probably should. We take Axio. Lateral. PA. AP. Got a hold still so the doctor can't see. In this example, the patient isn't able to lower their elbow to the image receptor, causing improper positioning of an AP elbow due to the large amount of void or object to image distance. Creating distance between the object and cassette, known as void, will create magnification of the part of interest. Here is an example of void. In this example, the patient isn't able to lower their elbow to the image receptor, causing improper positioning due to the part of interest in the image receptor being angled without any compensation to the central ray and tube head. This will create a foreshortened image. Here is an example of a foreshortened image. In this example, the patient isn't able to lower their elbow to the image receptor, causing improper positioning due to the part of interest in the image receptor being angled with overcompensation to the central ray and the tube head angled to the part of interest. This will end up causing an elongated image. Here is an example of an elongated image. This is terrific demonstration of proper positioning of an AP elbow by making sure the part is parallel to the image receptor with no oid, perpendicular to the central ray while maintaining the entire part on the same plane. Here is an example of a terrific demonstration of an AP elbow. Our next topic of discussion is collimation. Collimation is a fundamental component in producing a high quality film because tighter collimation will decrease the photon interaction that causes scatter. Choosing not to collimate will result in increased density and decreased contrast, disallowing an optimal image from being obtained. Coning is tight. Honing is tight. Bye bye. Honing is tight. Patience part in the light. Collimation side to side. See the shadow in the light. What it takes to cone real tight. It's the way I'm coning. It will turn. Here's an example of improper collimation for a PA hand. In this image, visibility will be decreased due to increased scatter. Here's an example of a properly collimated PA hand. There should only be a half inch border around the soft tissue of the hand. Our next topic of discussion is marker placement. Correct marker placement is essential for proper diagnosis and is also a requirement for legal purposes. Markers should never obscure the anatomy of interest or be electronically placed after the exposure. When I walk on by, text me looking like Manny Fly. 
I move to the B, walking down the halls in my Cherokee. Yeah. This is how I roll, sell it all friends, girls out of control. Muggers on the film, give it to the doctors, we ready to go. When I walk in the room, this is what I see. Okay. Patient on the table, and they're staring at me. Got a marker on my film, and I ain't afraid to show it, show it, show it, show it. Left side is not nowhere. Here's an example of incorrect marker placement. The marker is obscuring the anatomy of interest. Here's an example of electronically marking a film after the exposure. This can not only lead to side placement errors, but also nullifies the legality of the film. Here's an example of correct marker placement. The future radiographer places the marker on the lateral side of the extremity, outside of the anatomy and inside the collimated borders. Our next topic of discussion is shielding. When taking images at an institution that utilizes multiple exposures on a single film, it is important to properly shield the film. This prevents double exposure and unwanted density unrelated to the anatomy. Lead strips can also be placed behind lateral spine work to collect scatter and improve image contrast. Here's an example of omitting lead shielding on a multiple exposure film. This will result in unwanted density across the unshielded portion. The lack of shielding could also result in double exposure of the images. Here's an example of a properly shielded three view exposure wrist film. It's important to shield all the unused parts of the film that are not being used. Our final topic of discussion is technique. Setting technique consists of two main controls, KVP, which is the quality of the beam, and mass, which is the quantity of the beam. As a radiologic technologist, it is not only crucial to know base techniques, but to also understand how to adjust them for patient size or pathological conditions. Boom, up the mass, bump it up. If you want more x-rays, if the part is thicker, measure them and make some changes. How I set technique, get your thumb on the exposure switch, make x-rays. In this example, the future radiographer sets a technique that is much too high for her patient's KUB. Not only will this result in a grossly overexposed film, but is also in violation of ALARA. Here's an example of using a caliper to measure patient size prior to taking the exposure for a KUB. This measurement allows the future radiographer to set techniques specific to their patient and attain a better image. By multiplying the patient thickness by 2 and adding 30, the KVP value can be determined. If the KVP value is greater than 90, subtract 10 KVP and double the base mass. Well, that wraps up our time here today. Remember, it's your job as future radiologic technologists to understand the factors that affect image quality. By applying the objectives we talked about today, grid use, film size selection, artifact removal, proper patient positioning, collimation, correct marker placement, shielding, and setting technique. Remember, you too can produce the best image possible.